We've talked about definite descriptions, now we're going to talk about proper names. Um, it does seem odd that so much is made of these kind of tiny parts of language, but um, they are key parts of language as far as the project that was started by Frege and continued by Russell of <coughs> trying to explain how it is that language means by, in some sense, representing or picking out features of the world. Um, key elements of language in this project are going to be the referring expressions, the expressions that that's their job. I mean, certainly there are parts of language that their job is, is not to pick out features of the world, like conjunctions or strictly grammatical, uh, where the function of the word is strictly grammatical. But where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, is these referring expressions. They're supposed to tie bits of language to the world, and they're the means by which language talks about the world, and uh, the existence of them enables us to talk about bits of language being true or false. Um, so they are important. And it turns out that there are all kinds of complications when you look closely at these concepts. So, uh, we've already seen actually some talk of names um, in uh, Frager and Russell. We, we didn't talk about Mill. Mill um, actually has uh, a, a view on names before Frager that proper names like Aristotle or Simon Cushing, don't have a meaning. They are parts of language that don't mean anything. They just, they're like little uh, tags, like a tag on your clothes or your luggage. They don't, they themselves don't mean anything. They just label something. So their sole function is to denote, is to pick something out in the world without themselves having a meaning built into them. Now, that was, so that was Mill's view. Then along comes Frege with his example of Hesperus and Phosphorus, where he says, here you've got names that denote, and what they both denote is um, the planet Venus, but they cannot, they cannot be just denotation to the names, because if there was, then in every context you could replace uh, Hesperus with Phosphorus and it wouldn't affect the meaning or truth of the sentence. But of course, uh, Frege points out that Hesperus is Hesperus is what is called an analytic truth. It is something that you can, even if you don't know what Hesperus is, you can say, yes, that's true. It has to be true, it cannot possibly be false because it's like saying A equals A. But Hesperus is, is phosphorus. Mo the Greeks didn't know this. This is a genuine discovery. So that is obviously a different kind of truth. It's what uh, tends to be called a synthetic truth, where um, it's genuinely informative. If you're told that A equals B, you've learned something. If you're told that A equals A, you haven't really learned something. So there must be, uh, there must be more to proper names than just their denotation, according to Frege. So he makes this distinction between sense and reference, where he says that uh, where referring expressions have both uh, a sense and a reference. And sometimes you can have names that have sense only. They don't have a reference. So uh, Frege's position is actually that names essentially have a sense, but only contingently have a reference. So the sense, according to Frege, is the means by which a name refers. And it might, and uh, as Russell sort of worked on this idea, suggested that it was a set of descriptions. And the way that a name secures its reference is the uh, the descriptions must be true of a particular object. So names denote by um, having 
descriptions built into them and they den denote the thing that the descriptions pick out. Okay, so that's Frege and Russell. Um, now the million position never really went away uh, and there was um, a philosopher called Ruth Barkin Marcus who um, supported the million position and she ended up being a huge influence on the next guy we're going to talk about, Saul Kripke, who uh, basically comes back with the million position with a vengeance. And if there's a dominant view on proper names today, it's almost certainly the Kripkean one, so Mill wins out in the end, although Frege has a lot of defenders. Now, but the, what we're going to look at today is a paper called Proper Names by a guy called John Searle. John Searle is still alive. This uh, paper was from the late 50s, um, and if uh, you read it, it says at the end, uh, University of Oxford, but he's actually an American who was a graduate student at the time in Oxford where he was, uh, he bumped into Peter Strawson and a bunch of the, uh, Oxford was the place to be in the mid-century, mid-20th century. Uh, so he went over there and absorbed all of the ideas there. And one thing you can say about Searle is he's a very clear writer. Another thing you can say about Searle is that he's a colossal asshole. I'm sorry to say that while he's still alive, but um, he just got his emeritus professorship from the University of Berkeley revoked because of sexual misconduct allegations. I mean, the guy's in his 90s, please. It's, uh, at some point, you know, you gotta, you gotta retire from that stuff. Uh, but even before that came out, he was famous for various, um, he was very opposed to the counterculture, which of course was big in Berkeley in the 60s. He was very outspoken against the hippies and stuff. Uh, so Searle, not a great guy. Sadly, Kripke, not a great guy either. Kripke's died fairly recently, but he also had uh, sexual misconduct allegations against him and um, in general, uh, not a very um, salubrious person. But try and put that aside. Uh, because both of them write very clearly. I, uh, Kripke's very full of himself, as we'll see when we get there. Um, and Searle's not uh, a blushing and modest either. But um, they do present a view clearly. Searle is probably most famous for an argument he gives in the philosophy of mind uh, called the Chinese room argument. If you've heard of any argument from the philosophy of mind, you might have heard of this one, where he argue it's an argument that um, artificial intelligence is, of a certain kind will be impossible because um, a program cannot understand in the way that we do, and it's a famous argument. So he, he made several contributions, but in general, uh, I think what Searle is great at is presenting uh, the best encapsulation of a particular view just before that view is shown to be wrong. And that's what happens uh, here, where he presents sort of the best version of the Frege-Russell idea that names have uh, meanings or senses built into them just before Kripke comes along and sweeps that view away. Now, as I said, uh, certainly there are people who would defend it um, and, you know, have come back. but. Kripke's view was seen as like transformational. There's also some controversy whether he just stole some of his ideas from Ruth Bark and Marcus. That's another uh, problem, problematic element to Kripke, but we'll get there in a second. Okay, so um, the Hesperus Phosphorus argument looks pretty good. Uh, why might you go back to a million view? Um, well, Searle sort of suggests, okay, here's another reason to believe a Fregean view that names have sense as well as reference. And he says, look at where, how we teach names. Uh, we teach the use of proper names by first identifying an object and second explaining that the name applies to that object. So, 
the rules for a proper name, as Searle says, must somehow be logically tied to particular characteristics of the object in such a way that the name has a sense as well as a reference. How, unless the name has a sense, is it correlated with the object? In other words, there seems to be a puzzle. How is it that we're able to use names to pick something out? Um, it must be that there's something built into the name that is, as Frege puts it, directions for using it to refer. And this is particularly true of names like Aristotle. We believe we are able to talk about Aristotle. Of course, we can't point to Aristotle because Aristotle has been atoms for two millennia, right? We can't, we can't pick, we can't sort of say, I'm talking, uh, when I say Aristotle, I mean him. I can't sort of directly uh, refer to somebody uh, to, to Aristotle. So if I'm using the word successfully, if I say Aristotle was Plato's student, that seems to be a successful and true statement that picks out Aristotle and that's how it is able to be true. It must be somehow that Aristotle has information that enables me to use that name to pick out Aristotle. So that's uh, a consideration in favor of the Phrygian position. Now, this is in Searle's article. He considers what a million might say in response, a, a, someone who has Mill's view. Uh, actually, what you're, te what you're teaching, when you're, what you're doing when you say you're picking out a characteristic and you're saying that's what we mean by Aristotle, you're, that's just uh, a way that teaches someone how to use Aristotle to refer, but it's not actually, you're not actually saying that that's part of Aristotle. And an illustration of why it can't be the case that, um, you know, whatever characteristics you use to, uh, to pick out Aristotle aren't built into the name is suppose you say, um, suppose the characteristics you say, okay, Here's, uh, I'm going to teach you about Aristotle. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher born in Stagira. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but suppose that's true. Um, and you learn that and you think, okay, that's Aristotle. Later on, you can find out that actually Aristotle was not born in Stagira. But given that that's possible, that shows that born in Stagira cannot be built into the name. Because if it was, then uh, if born in Stagira was part of the meaning of Aristotle, as the Phrygian seems to suggest, then it would be literally impossible to find out that Aristotle was not born in Stagira. Because uh, the way Russell, uh, in a later uh, work than um, his famous On Denoting, he writes that proper names can be analyzed into definite descriptions, uh, which is like his fleshing out of the Phrygian idea. So a name just is a bunch of definite descriptions. So you can take out Aristotle and replace it with the definite descriptions that are at sense. But if all you know about Aristotle is that he's born in Stagira, then Aristotle is not born in Stagira. You could translate into the Greek philosopher born in Stagira was not born in Stagira. And that's false. And it's a contradiction, and you could never learn that. Whereas it's obviously clear that you could. It makes perfect sense to say, oh, we just found out Aristotle wasn't born in Stagira. So what that tells us, says the million, is that Aristotle cannot mean the philosopher born in Stagira, as the million suggests. Um, Searle's response, his uh, response in an anti-million response is, look, you the million are saying all there is to names is just their denotation. Um, but we could find out that Aristotle never existed. I mean, there are people, uh, I don't think anybody's going to say that Aristotle, I, I, I suppose it's possible it could be a huge conspiracy. I mean, people certainly argue that Jesus never existed. Um, 
because they, you know, they point to the paucity of reference to him in historians at the time and, and things like that. Um, there's certainly a lot less historical record of Jesus than there is of Aristotle. Aristotle is very exhaustively uh, documented by multiple sources. Um, but, you know, suppose it turns out Aristotle never existed. Um, the, what does that mean on the million interpretation? It means there's, Aristotle doesn't refer to anything. There is no reference for Aristotle. And then Searle says, but suppose it turns out that there's a guy called Aristotle living in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1903. Doesn't that disprove Aristotle never existed? Um, and if you say, well, wait a minute, uh, not that Aristotle, I'm talking about the ancient Greek. And Searle so is going to say, well, how can you distinguish? If it's just a label, it labels anything appropriate. And if there's a guy called Aristotle in Hoboken, then that disproves the claim that Aristotle never existed. And you millions who say, well, I didn't mean that Aristotle, well, why not? Why can't the name, if the name is just a label, there's no way to say that when I use Aristotle, it doesn't mean the guy in New Jersey. If you, if you want to say that, you, there has to be something built into the name so that it doesn't pick out just anyone called Aristotle. It has to have what's built into the name, things like definite descriptions. Okay, so um, what is the correct view? Given we've got the, the million problem that uh, actually um, Kripke is going to bring up again uh, with, with great force, that um, if that a name can't just be a set of definite descriptions. So, you know, obviously, um, suppose I responded to the Aristotle problem. So the Aristotle problem was, how is it that I can find out that Aristotle wasn't born in Stagira? And I can use that to refer to Aristotle, even though one of the very few things I knew about Aristotle was that he was born in Stagira. How can I still say, oh, Aristotle wasn't born in Stagira, without that meaning the guy who was born in Stagira wasn't born in Stagira? Well, suppose I say, okay, I know that's not all I know about Aristotle. I know a bunch of things. You know, wrote the Nicomachean Ethics, was Plato's greatest student, founded the Lyceum. Was it the Lyceum? Um, all of these things. You know, uh, tutored Alexander the Great. That's the best fact about um, Aristotle. Uh, you know, so list, I list a bunch of facts. And then, you know, if I have a bunch of facts, then maybe I can afford to lose the fact that he was born in Stagira. But no, because then it looks like you've still got the problem. Because you say, the Greek philosopher who was born in Stagira and tutored Alexander the Great and was Plato's greatest student wasn't born in Stagira. That's still a contradiction because it's still got that description as part of it. So you've still got this problem that if the meaning of a name has, a def has descriptions built into it, then you could never find out that one of the descriptions is false. And this comes up all the time. I mean, uh, Shakespeare, like uh, people are always saying, actually Shakespeare didn't write that play. You know, so you th if the meaning of Shakespeare was wrote Romeo and Juliet, wrote The Tempest, wrote Macbeth, wrote um, you know, Richard III and all of those, didn't write The Tempest. Well, then you're saying the author of a bunch of things, including The Tempest, didn't write The Tempest. That's still a contradiction. You can't say that. So how, then, do we reconcile this? Uh, it seems like both sides have good points. Fr um, Frege's got the point about Hesperus and Phosphorus that seem to suggest that there must be sense to names. The million has got this point about Aristotle. Uh, you could never find out that Aristotle wasn't born in Stagira. Um, Searle's response is to come up with uh, what became known as the cluster model of names. That is, that names are a bunch of um, definite descriptions, but not any specific ones. And different people using the name can have a different cluster of definite descriptions. 
And because no single one of those is essential to the name, uh, you can always find out that that's not true of it. Your cluster can be altered. And he argues for this by saying, let's look at, we, we have um, three main kinds of referring expressions. We have definite descriptions that we've looked at, like the, the, the greatest student of Plato, the tutor of Alexander the Great. Um, those refer, obviously, only in virtue of those characteristics. Now, actually, of course, Donnellan disputes this, but what, uh, what Searle is talking about there is the attributive use of definite descriptions. That is, the uh, Jones's murderer refers to whoever it is that murdered Jones, or oh, it was Smith, wasn't it, in Donnellan's example. Um, he's taught, so the attributive use of definite descriptions, how does that work? It refers to whomever fits the description, and if nobody fits the description, it doesn't refer. Um, what about demonstratives? What are demonstratives? Actually, demonstratives constitute what Russell said are the only logically proper names. Demonstratives are words like this and that. They're words you say when you're literally pointing at something, or even internally. You can say, that sensation is pain, um, so you don't actually have to use your fingertips. But you can, they refer uh, by directly picking something out. So you've got, on the one extreme, definite descriptions denote. That is, they pick out by descriptions, and what do they pick out? Whatever fits the description. Demonstratives refer, you might say. They point to something directly. So why do we need names? Names, should, uh, names on the Millian model are just like demonstratives. Names on the Fregean model are just like definite descriptions. But why do, we, why do we need names if either of those will do? Well, Russell, of course, thought that we could replace names with definite descriptions. Whereas Searle says, names should fall somewhere in the middle. He says, names are not definite descriptions. They are pegs on which we hang definite descriptions. So, um, proper names are useful precisely because they cannot be replaced by precise definite descriptions. They enable us to refer publicly to objects without being forced to raise the identity of the object. They function not as descriptions, so he disagrees with Russell, but as pegs on which to hang descriptions. So the name Aristotle does have a meaning, and it is a bunch of definite descriptions, but it's no specific set. So you can find out that Aristotle was not born in Stagira, and what that means is, okay, uh, my cluster of descriptions, I take that out of it. Um, and I'm, but I'm left with enough definite descriptions to pick something out. Okay, so that's Searle's view. And sounds pretty good. It explains, uh, it, it charts a sort of middle ground between Mill and Russell on uh, whether or not proper names have de are associated with definite descriptions or not, and distinguishes um, proper names as referring expressions from demonstratives and definite descriptions. Pretty good going for a graduate student. Um, but then along comes Kripke, as we shall see.